Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, the first chapter. Now there was a Pharisee called Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. Well, I'll bet you're thinking that I'm going to preach about love from above. That wouldn't be far off. And I can do that. I can preach about love from above. But I'd rather at least begin with the snake on a stake. Where Jesus informs Nicodemus that the Son of Man must be lifted up, like the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. Way, way back, when God's people were in their wilderness wanderings, they started complaining to God and to Moses about only having manna to eat. It was their way of showing rejection and mistrust and unbelief. And as a result, poisonous snakes break into the camp and cause a great deal of death and harm. So the Lord tells Moses to make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look on it and live. Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look on the serpent of bronze and live. Jesus uses the snake on a stake story to illustrate for Nicodemus the point of his mission. However, as spiritual metaphor, the bronze serpent is loaded with mystery and meaning and the more you study, the more fantastic it becomes. For one thing, the image gets retained by the nation of Israel, given the name Nehushtan, which literally means, I kid you not, brass thingy. <laughs> and eventually gets worshipped as an idol in the holy temple. To add some more craziness, Nehushtan is the one and only graven image authorized and instructed by God who commanded thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image 
or likeness of anything that's in the heaven above or the earth below or under the earth in the water. What did it look like? Well, those poisonous serpents that are described in the NRSV are called fiery serpents in the King James Bible. In the book of Isaiah, they're called fiery flying serpents, all of which sounds like dragons or dragon-like creatures. The NRS NRSV has a footnote that says that the Hebrew word is seraphim. They are seraphim snakes, which explains both the fiery part and the flying part, since seraphim are these glistering winged creatures. The serpent on a pole has the appearance of a heavenly seraph. When the book of Revelation describes Satan as the great dragon, perhaps that's a literary allusion to these mythic creatures. But more baffling and astounding is the Lord's own self is similarly described as dragon-like. For example, listen to these words from Psalm 18. The earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. The Lord bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind. In various Old Testament instances, Yahweh seems to be portrayed as a flying storm god or god of natural disasters similar to Thor or Zeus or Jupiter. Probably our commonest mental visual of God, the God of the Old Testament, is judgmental, cruel, whimsical, arbitrary, dangerous, untrustworthy. Somehow this negative image of God has gotten down deep into our spiritual DNA. A problem with holding this view, I think, is that we're always looking over our shoulder. There's suspicion and confusion. When catastrophe strikes, did God do it? Or was it just the bad weather? Anyway, here's another passage where this mighty figure in the sky doles out some devastating wonders. It's from a chapter in the book, book of Nahum. And it's a personal favorite because of the message that it leads to. Listen for it. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt the earth is burned at his presence, yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide the fierceness of his anger when his fury is poured out like fire and all the rocks are thrown down by him? But the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who put their trust in him. We've been talking about law and gospel in that first section that I just read. That's all law. God punishing the world with holy calamity. But that last verse, that's pure gospel. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good, a stronghold. He knows those who put their trust in him. As the book of James says, mercy always triumphs over judgment. The incident involving Moses, God's law, or excuse me, Moses, God's people, and the fiery biting ser seraphim also contains the message of law and gospel. First, the people bitterly complain against Moses' leadership and God's sheltering protection and provision. Simply put, they reject God's management of them. They spurn God's law. 
Next, deep-seated mistrust and disbelief lead to devastating personal consequences, as these things do. Here, the intrusion of fiery, winged, poisonous creatures into the camp. Finally, it says that if they gaze on the impaled image, meaning if they believe God's promise, they would be healed from the effects of their disobedience. The image on a pole symbolizes the gospel promise of how God and his relentless love and goodness vanquishes every threat of doubt and death. To paraphrase Jesus, for God so loved Israel that he gave them one graven image that whoever would believe God's promise by gazing at it may not perish but be restored to human life. It's time for us to impale our image of God as a dangerous serpent. God knows two things, that we're going to fail and that poisonous consequences are going to happen. But when we do mess up, if we will believe in the power of unrelenting love, our failures fade, our lives renew, and troublesome serpents slink away. The bronze pole, the holy cross with all its goodness, is raised at the ready to intervene for every kind of screw-up, no matter how bad. Thus, our Lord instructs Nicodemus and instructs us, too, to gaze with faith, believing that love and goodness always prevail. I have permission to tell you this story. It's about choosing never to stop loving and the power that that can have. My oldest daughter claims to be my favorite. I regularly reply that all my children are equally the favorite. The only difference is she's been the favorite for the longest. This daughter was abused in the church from age 8 to 16. She kept it really well hidden, but also acted out because of the signs of abuse. Since we didn't know better, we responded with exasperation and punishment, lots and lots of punishment. We were stupid and wrong. When everything came out into the open, victim and perpetrator were treated, perpetrator were treated by the church in the way that you might expect. The abuser was excused and forgiven, and my precious firstborn was excommunicated. The senior pastor required me to break off all relationship with her. He had this horribly failed notion that by withholding relationship, she would be convinced to behave differently and perhaps repent. My compliance with the requirement lasted about a week. After that, I said inside myself, there's no way I'm ever going to turn my back on my daughter. The pastor was furious, and we had a heated public shouting match over my refusal to comply. I pointed out the parables of the lost coin and the lost sheep, how the shepherd and the woman committed to nothing else to keep on searching for sheep and coin. Incredulously, he countered that those two parables had nothing to do with people, but were only about stories about sheep and coins. His response was absurd. It was crazy. My daughter was on her own, kind of lost and trying to figure life out. She missed us. We missed her. There were brief moments of connection, but the pain of the past hurts would become unbearable and she'd close her off herself from relationship again and again. They were difficult years for her mother and I, as you can well imagine. Fast forward. Today, 
She's a happily married mom and professional with a long, impressive resume. She and her three uh, siblings, meaning my son and other two daughters, four of them, they all talk together about owning a compound where we all can live together, including her parents. Best of all, she's still my favorite <laughs> for the longest. If you ask her today, she'll tell you that her mama and her daddy are her best friends. During her teenage and young adult years, you can imagine the intense emotional pain that there was for all of us. Our family was torn apart. We had no indication that we'd ever be restored or that she would ever want to be restored, but we kept on putting ourselves out there, keeping in contact, staying open, inviting. We kept on lifting up the possibility of return, relationship, goodness, and grace, like lifting up in front of her a bronze serpent and always holding its image out in front. We kept on loving. We tried to love as God loved, as God loved Israel as God loved the world. Changing the metaphor, we took the road less traveled by. Love is the road less traveled. We took the road less traveled by and that made all the difference. Amen. <laughs>